Ми знаходимося в готовності до дій у разі виникнення будь-яких ситуацій. Відслідковуємо наявність військових сил на території суміжної держави. Наша задача – тримати під контролем кордон. So if it will be some situation, we will fight. If you want peace, you should be prepared for the war. The border with Belarus stretches for over a thousand kilometers. All along this northern frontier, the men and women of Ukraine's border guard are getting ready. They may be called upon to be this country's first line of defense. Основна задача прикордонників це у разі можливої якоїсь ескалації конфлікту це стримати. The enemy is not Belarus. But somewhere beyond this barbed wire fence, Russia has deployed its forces on Belarusian territory. Artillery and fighter jets, tanks and rocket systems. This right here is a highly strategic spot because up that road, about an hour away, are the Russian forces. Thousands of troops, hundreds of tanks. And down that road is Kiev. It's pretty much a straight paved road all the way to the capital. The thought of Russian tanks rolling down this road evokes the spectre of conflict on a terrifying scale. Washington and London have warned an invasion could be imminent. Moscow calls that hysteria, while at the same time pumping out pictures of military hardware making its way into Belarus. Their troops welcomed with a traditional greeting of bread and salt. In Kiev, there's a strange feeling of unreality about the looming threat. People here are used to war. There's been fighting in the East for nearly eight years, and yet the authorities have been playing down the current threat, saying the Russians do not currently have enough forces in place for a full-scale invasion. But a former Ukrainian deputy defense minister, who still advises the government, told me the build-up of troops on the Belarusian border was concerning. So what we prognose is the most possible uh, scenarios. This is the um, attempt to isolate Kiev, to have an operation like uh, surrounding Kiev and uh, um, uh, don't let the, uh, our Ukrainian government to actually to operate and to manage the country in these situations. And this operation requires less forces and is uh, possible because of the um, uh, now exercises in Belarus when they have more Russian troops in Belarus. The Russians aren't the only ones showing off their military hardware. Last week, we traveled to the far west of Ukraine to see Ukrainian forces trying out some new weaponry, shoulder-held anti-tank missiles provided by the UK. Also there, a small contingent of British forces. How many of you are there? Uh, so the training team is ranging between eight to nine individuals. Who wanted to be filmed but didn't want to talk. For now, this is a war not of tanks and bombs, but of images and of words, fought between Russia and its traditional NATO foe, with the Ukrainians stuck in the middle. We are proud that we are Ukrainian soldiers. We are proud that we are, we are Ukrainian officers. We are proud that we, are, we have such kind of uh, support and help. And we will do everything possible to defend our country. Nowhere is the tension between East and West felt more keenly than in Lviv. Over the past century, control of this city has passed from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, to Poland, to Nazi Germany, then to the Soviet Union, and now independent Ukraine. 
хочу звернути вашу увагу, обратити увагу, mm -hmm. на те, що, бачите, є железобетонне перекриття. In the basement of a residential block, they're preparing a bomb shelter. One of thousands across the city. In the 1980s, Oleg served in Afghanistan, alongside Russian and other Soviet soldiers. Now he faces the prospect of fighting against his former brothers in arms. А ви, якщо буде необхідність, ви готові взяти винтовку? Так, однозначно. Якщо Росія дає мountain інвазію, то шанси її відправити сили так далеко в вісті вісті вісті. Але Львів є в комбативному моді. The mayor told me he wanted every man and woman here to be capable of handling a gun. For decades, this city has been one of the centers of Ukrainian national identity, an identity that has been defined in opposition to Moscow. In the garrison church of Saints Peter and Paul, they have a shrine dedicated to those sons of Lviv who've been killed fighting Russian-backed forces in Donbass. Father Taras Mihalchuk spends much of his time traveling to the east. Right, yeah. That's uh, someone's water bottle that's obviously been hit by shrapnel. Ministering to those on the front lines of a war that is already eight years old. Do you worry that this conflict is entering a, a new and more dangerous phase now? Безумовно, сьогодні ситуація, в якій ми опинилися, вона виглядає дещо не дещо небезпечніше, ніж було до цього часу. Проте для мене, який уже вісім років, скажімо, переживає, для мене війна має певне своє обличчя. Війна має сльози реальних людей, дітей, маленьких дітей, батьки, яких загинули, офіцерів нашої армії української. Ось. І для мене це є обличчя, так? і для мене ворог є чітко виражений, і це, це, це ім'я, це, це є наш північний сусід Росії. The deep connection between Ukraine and Russia goes back much further than a shared Soviet past. It was here a thousand years ago, in Kiev, in this stretch of river, that Prince Vladimir baptized his people, founding the Russian Orthodox Church. And the further north and east you travel, the more likely you are to meet Ukrainians who, despite everything, have a sense of their connection to Russia through shared bonds of history and of faith. Back near the Belarusian border, in the town of Ovruch, is the chapel of St. Basil the Great. Here, they have a shrine not to the fallen of Donbass. Ah, oh, this is, yeah. What's the day for the last Tsar of Russia. The Emperor Nicholas II visited here in 1911, six years before he was overthrown and then executed by the Bolsheviks. Since the end of communism, the Russian Orthodox Church has functioned not just as a source of spiritual authority, but as an instrument of Russian soft power.
У нас обстановка в Украине, наша власть, Украина уже положена на лопатки. Украины уже как бы нет. Все. The image of Ukraine as a chaotic, failing state is part of the Kremlin's playbook. It's a message designed both for domestic Russian consumption, don't flirt with the West, but also part of Moscow's PR campaign in Ukraine. This propaganda war has been going on for years. The more urgent question is, could that develop into a full-scale actual war? The point of highest danger will come in the next few weeks, says Ukraine's former deputy defense minister. 20th of February is a very interesting day. This is the last day of the Olympic Games, and this is the last day of the exercises in Belarus. So we see that at the end of February, they will be more ready from the point of view of capabilities. They will be ready mentally from the point of view of Olympics. They will have maximum forces concentration in Belarus. If the Russians do invade from the north, they'll quite likely pass through this strange, deserted area right on the Belarusian border. It was in the dying days of the Soviet Union that people suddenly abandoned their homes here after an explosion at a nuclear power plant. Chernobyl. The very word became synonymous with the callous incompetence of a sclerotic regime after Moscow tried to cover up the accident. What happened here 35 years ago contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union and Ukraine splitting off and becoming an independent country. And now, even though it's so eerily quiet, it feels like this place is on the front line again. The whole area around Chernobyl is now a closed zone, a place where the clock stopped 35 years ago. At a time when Ukraine was still shackled to its more powerful neighbour. The abandoned railway station. Yuri Shahraychuk, the colonel in the border guard, was three years old when the reactor exploded. He and his parents were eventually evacuated. It's like a time capsule. Now, as he contemplates the possibility of a Russian invasion, he's the father of two young children himself. Как вы думаете, когда он будет и она будет, как бы в возрасте? Им приходится будет воевать. Дай бог, чтобы не. Дай бог, чтобы не. Але выхование своих детей, перш за все, треба будувати на патріотичній основі. Що Україна це наша територія, це наша земля, це наша батьківщина, і вона повинна бути суверенна і неподільна. Да. А посадитесь для них, для них, для їх будущего. Ні, на території України за майбутнє своїх дітей я не, не боюсь взагалі. Я надію, що Україна стане процвітаючою державою і мої діти будуть виїжджати в світ і хвалитися тим, що вони саме приїхали з України. Україна і Росія are two countries divided by a common history. That is the fundamental tension here. And it'll continue to fuel this crisis, whatever happens, in the next few dangerous weeks. <laughs>